Hello, hello. It's been some time, but uh, I'm back with you today to uh, just go over some of the updates that have been made to the latest version of the Sikorsky S92. Uh, the latest version is 1.4, and it's for X-Plane 11. So for those of you who might have the S92 or have recently purchased the S92 and who also have X-Plane 11, uh, surely you've noticed that it doesn't quite work, at least not well, in X-Plane 11. And this update addresses that, as well as a few other things. There's some improvements to the flight model, as well as some of the objects and shading. So one of the coolest uh, th things that uh, was updated in the latest update to X-Plane, the simulator, uh, is the, the shading and the shader model. It now includes... Uh, physically based rendering or uh, which basically translates to reflective properties uh, as well as some other cool things that happen with glass materials so I'll just sh start by by showing off a little bit of what's new and what works and uh, kind of go from there so first of all the main thing is that the S92 works now. That's <laughs> that's really the, the main thing here. So uh, in the new user interface here, we can kind of go through and scroll either with the mouse wheel or from this little drop-down menu, uh, the different liveries that are available. And there are also uh, all of the, the variants that existed in the previous iterations of the S92 are still available. The CH-148, there's a search and rescue uh, variant. There's a VIP variant as well as a, a somewhat fictional uh, VH-92 variant for the uh, the Marine Corps squadron that flies for the U.S. government, namely Marine One for the president. But let's load the default or traditional primarily used variant, which is the offshore air taxi model. So we can kind of scroll through here and let's pick, uh, oh, let's pick the, the PHI paint scheme here. So we'll start a flight. Okay, so here we are. Uh, in the cockpit here you can see uh, much of the cockpit is the same as it always has been. Uh, the shading, uh, just as a result of how uh, uh, the shader model works in X-Plane 11, in my opinion, looks better than it has before. Uh, we updated a few little things like the, the, the throttle handles or the power selecting levers. Uh, uh, we updated with a little bit of a added detail here. There, there are these buttons here that you press uh, if you want to move the throttles that way they don't move accidentally or inadvertently when you're flying uh, to or from idle stop or fly so that's just a little bit of an added detail and uh, more of a major addition here is the FMS the old FMS that used to exist in X-Plane doesn't work anymore doesn't even exist anymore so there's a, a newly modeled and newly mapped version of the FMS. And if you are wanting to use the FMS, what I strongly suggest, other than using the, the little buttons here in the 3D cockpit, is to if you actually click the screen, it will bring up a, a little pop-up window here that makes it uh, a lot easier and it's kind of more intuitive to click the buttons and the settings that you want for your flight. Then to close it, there's this little uh, red dot here, and that will get it out of the way. Um, as far as uh, other additions or changes are concerned, uh, if we go outside the aircraft, we'll see that uh, the shader model is a little bit different now. So uh, the normal maps have changed uh, somewhat to include uh, metal reflective textures. So uh, for the most part, many of the paint schemes are uh, have a have a shininess or a sheen to them, which we've incorporated here. 
you can see some of the bumps from rivets and seams in the way that the, the helicopter is manufactured, but uh, kind of cool the, the amount of detail that's added just by reflecting certain colors and the sky and other aspects of the environment that we can now actually see on the body of the aircraft. As always, the, the cabin door, uh, no matter which variant you're trying to fly or use, is linked to the flap parameter of the simulator. So if you want to open the door, what you can uh, do is uh, one of two things. If you navigate back into the cabin and actually look at the door handle, whether you're inside or outside, you can click on the handle and it will open. Uh, this is the air stair uh, version, so there's two stages. There's one handle to open the top part, and then this other little handle will open the stairs for you. And if you don't feel like going through that whole process, uh, if you just have a button on your keyboard or a button on your joystick or yoke or whatever you might be using uh, to toggle the flaps or cycle through the flaps, you can do that as well. So. Let's raise the flaps in one stage. That'll raise the air stair. Then another stage, hey, we'll close the top part. So that's how that works. And then as far as the ramp is concerned, the cargo area, uh, you can either click the switch on the overhead panel here. There you see the ramp switch. You can click that and the ramp will open. This is tied to the canopy parameter of the simulator. So this helicopter obviously doesn't have a canopy like uh, one you would find in a, a fighter jet or something like that. So we've sort of commandeered it to do our bidding here and open and close uh, the cargo ramp. So if you don't want to click the, the switch in the 3D cockpit, if uh, you have a... Uh, a button on your keyboard, joystick, or what have you, linked to the canopy, that will allow you to toggle the canopy, like so. As far as the lights are concerned, those are still linked to the same parameters as, the, as they always have been. The landing lights are connected to uh, array zero, so there's uh, there are multiple landing lights on this uh, aircraft. Not necessarily landing lights, but as far as the simulator is concerned, they're landing lights so that they spill light onto the scenery at night, uh, onto the terrain, and onto the aircraft. So the ones in front, which actually function as landing lights, are array zero. So you'll see, uh, let's actually go to it here. Under the joystick settings, I have it linked to one of my joystick buttons here. Uh, somewhere. Nope, it's actually a keyboard setting. What am I talking about? Uh, it would be under... Uh, oops, landing light. And here you can see there are numerous array values for the landing lights. Landing lights 0, landing lights 1, and so forth. So, uh, here the simulator actually calls out landing light 1 because there's a no array value of 0. But if, if you're dealing at a data reference level, the array is actually 0. But in this case, the lights that are actually the landing lights on the front are these, landing light 1. And I, I linked that to the keyboard input of control L. Uh, the other lights... Um, there, there are actually two sets of them. I linked to the landing lights as, as a whole, and I made that optional. You can make it whatever you want. If you click this and enter a, uh, a, a keystroke, it will record it, and that will be the button you use to turn on and off the light. So control L, you'll see, will turn on and off these front lights, which are actually the landing lights. Then these other lights here, this one, which is for passenger loading, and then these ones back here, which aid in cargo loading at night, are linked to the the rest of the global landing light toggle switches. So those turn on and off like so. In the cabin, 
Uh, those are exterior lights, so they're over here on this side. Uh, you could find those here, cargo load and crew load, which essentially translates to passenger loading, which is here in the front. So crew load will turn on this light here next to the door. Cargo load will turn on these lights back here near the cargo ramp. Another sort of cool additional update you can find in the other aircraft variants. So let's open up the search and rescue version. So in this model, uh, in versions past, you may have noticed this little thing that's uh, hanging just below the nose of the aircraft, kind of on the chin here is actually a camera. And in the past, it just kind of remained static. It was there just for sort of aesthetic purposes because that's just the sort of equipment you would find on a search and rescue aircraft like this. Um, but now in this version, if you actually make your way back into the cabin, oops, there's this seat right here, which is for the search and rescue crew person who's tasked with dealing with the, the searchlight and the camera, now there's actually a video display on their screen where you can see what the camera would see. And uh, before these switches here on this little console would uh, articulate the, the searchlight, which uh, is out here, you could kind of see here, the searchlight. So in the past, this can be turned on and off and it will actually generate a pool of light on the scenery if you turn it on, which uh, might as well do it, right? Let's go over here. The, the button for that is located here on the overhead panel labeled searchlight. And let's, uh, let's make it later at night so you can actually see what it does. So, oh, that's a little too dark. So if you can notice here, it's actually casting a pool of light on the runway, and the higher you go, the, the broader the, the scope of that light's, light's impact will be on the terrain or the water or vessels or whatever it is you're trying to shine light upon. But uh, to, just to go back to the crew person's uh, position here in the cabin, let's actually turn on the lights. To turn on the lights in the cabin are under interior lights, which are on the right-hand side of the overhead panel. We'll turn on the, let's actually turn up the floodlight here so we can kind of see what we're, what we're pressing. Overhead, there's some other lights here that we can turn on that will brighten up the cabin. Yay, now we can see. All right, so if we were sitting here and if we were this person, it's actually kind of a night vision view through the camera at night. If you press these switches, it will move. Uh, before this used to move the searchlight alone, but now it moves the camera and the searchlight in concert. So the searchlight and the camera will point in the same direction. So now you can see we've, we've kind of skewed it off to the left-hand side of the aircraft here. So now, now the camera's pointed there and the searchlight's pointed there. So you can kind of see those changes take effect on the outside as well as the inside. So uh, let's just kind of get back to where we, oh goodness, where we were. So a little difficult to tell here. Let's brighten it up. Now you can see we're kind of looking off to the left, which is where the searchlight is pointed. So in the past, it was probably a little difficult to be in here and Yes, although uh, it is somewhat useful to use the knobs, wherever this arrow on the knob is pointed is where the searchlight is pointed relative to the aircraft. So if it's pointed there, you can pretty well be assured that it's pointed to the left, to the back, to the right, and so forth. Um, but now you can just can kind of confirm on the screen here. What you're seeing on the screen is precisely where the searchlight is pointed. And now you get the added benefit of kind of seeing what the camera would see as well. So uh, there we can see it. So kind of cool. Uh, 
as far as flying is concerned, not a huge uh, benefit or, or issue, but just an added little detail that could uh, add to whatever it is that you're trying to, to recreate in the simulator. Now there's some behind the scenes changes that have happened that uh, uh, as a user you wouldn't necessarily need to concern yourself with too much, but uh, if you tried to go through Plane Maker and update the aircraft yourself, uh, if you had version 1.3 trying to bring it into X-Plane 11, uh, you may have noticed that the, the starter has changed somewhat, the parameters that the simulator uses. So if you brought 1.3 into this simulator and started with the engines off, uh, the starter on, on the aircraft wouldn't be strong enough to actually start the engines, kind of a frustrating uh, uh, lack of functionality there, which has been updated and now it works. So if you start with the engines off uh, and you go through uh, kind of the checklist procedures here, uh, you can actually get the engines up and running now. Another detail that's been added, which you can find on either the uh, traditional offshore air taxi version or the VIP version, uh, is the ability to crash. Uh, not that you can't crash any of the, of the uh, variants, but in these particular models, you can crash and you'll actually see a fiery catastrophic result of whatever led you to come into grief in the simulator. So let's just kind of, uh, something goes wrong here, terribly wrong, and oh gosh, this happens. So now the, the aircraft kind of breaks apart, there's some fire. Um, hopefully this isn't something you encounter on a, on a regular basis, but uh, uh, just a little bit of an added detail, if you do, come into grief now, you can have sort of a more visceral, uh, visual uh, sort of impact or a result of those troubles. On the whole, the mapping for the various paint schemes, I know uh, some users and uh, third-party developers have created some paint schemes for the S92 uh, that don't ship in the initial package that, that you might acquire. The mapping for the textures is by and large the exact same. Uh, the normal maps have changed, uh, which uh, just is a, a way of dealing with and assigning reflective properties to the aircraft and the parts that, that need them. But if you have a custom paint scheme that you've made or or downloaded, it will still work. It'll all be mapped the same. The one thing that you just want to be aware of is that the normal map has changed. So th certain things are assigned and uh, the shader model is expecting uh, the normal map to tell it exactly what part should be exactly how shiny, um, which parts should reflect light, which parts shouldn't, and so forth. So if you have a custom normal map, you will want to take another look at that uh, and look at the ones that ship uh, with this update just as a point of comparison to make sure that uh, if you're using a normal map that's, uh, that's custom made, you, you, you'll probably have to, to change it a little bit so that the objects, if you're using HDR uh, shader mode uh, in the graphics setting, so that the, those display properly. But as far as the, the way that the objects are mapped to their respective paint schemes. Those are the same. So if you have a custom paint scheme, uh, no need to worry about having to, to re repaint those. As far as another sort of general housekeeping sort of improvement, uh, an issue that's arisen or that uh, I've noticed here is that when it's nighttime and let's make it a little darker here, and you have the cargo ramp light. There's actually a light inside the baggage compartment, which if you are in the VIP or offshore air taxi version, 
there's actually a, a wall here so you wouldn't be able to see straight back into the cargo hold but in, in any case it's uh, the same issue regardless when you were in the back of the aircraft on the old version in X-Plane 11 uh, maybe even in X-Plane 10 as well that light would kind of spill out despite the doors being closed uh, it, yeah, whether you call it a bug or just a uh, just a, an anomaly or a, a problem the light would spill out in an unrealistic way because of course if the doors are closed you shouldn't be seeing any light so that's been adjusted a little bit so now there's there's actually a 3d light here that won't actually start generating light in the simulator unless you open the ramp in which case you'll now see it's maybe hard to tell a little bit here but there's actually light coming out here that's spilling out onto the runway. Here it's maybe a little bit easier to see that it's actually, let's make it a bit darker still, you can see that it's generating light and it's actually hitting the runway as well as the back of the sponsons here, the, the landing gear, and you'll notice now that as the, the ramp closes, it actually disappears just to kind of force it to behave the way that a real light would real lights can't shine through solid cargo ramps so now that works as as you would expect it to all right let's make it uh, daytime again here uh, something else that's been improved in this version is uh, the ability to see in, uh, in, a, in a hover situation. Now, one of the most frustrating and difficult things to deal with in the simulator is trying to hover or land on a confined space, like uh, the oil rig or landing on the ship, um, uh, on the frigate, I should say. It's as if hovering wasn't hard enough. It's It's infinitely harder when your only cues as to where you are and what the situation in the hover is is limited to uh, a relatively small rectangle if you're sitting in front of a computer screen or even an array of rectangles if you're lucky enough to have some kind of panoramic display. Nonetheless, uh, there is for one thing a, a giant instrument panel and a glare shield and parts of the, of the aircraft blocking your view so when you're in the standard view here, uh, the S92 kind of hovers in a bit of a nose-high attitude. So you'll, you'll see that almost 50% almost of the screen is filled with kind of the, the sky and the, the terrain and the distance, which is pretty. Um, but when you're trying to, to hover and land somewhere uh, where there's a demanding small target that you're trying to hit, you really want to see more of the visual cues and things that you would need to see that are more directly in front of you. So if you have a, a head tracker uh, or something like that, like a uh, some kind of device that allows you to move your position in the cockpit or, or shift the, your field of view downwards, then it becomes a lot easier. It's more like real life. You could just crane your neck and kind of peek over the glare shield and make sure that you are where you need to be. But uh, if you're in a situation like most people are like me, uh, it, it's kind of difficult to take your hands off the, the stick or whatever control equipment you're using to control the aircraft to try to fiddle with the keyboard to get your view to look at what you need to see. So uh, in the past, what, what I've done and uh, what has worked for me has been using the uh, no panel view the or the the heads up display view because then you get a little bit of information about your airspeed and your altitude the problem here is yes the instrument panel is gone and you can see more but again the this the screen is split uh, almost horizontally across here where it's 50% sky and 50% ground and you sort of lack the ability to look down or just sh shift your field of view down so that more of the screen is filled with useful uh, 
points of reference. Uh, so to get to the point here, what we've done is created a, uh, a 2D, what, what would otherwise be the 2D panel view. Uh, I've adjusted it so that now, for whatever reason, X-Plane allows you to look down in this view. Um, so rather than having a giant 2D instrument panel blocking our vision, uh, it's largely transparent with some of the, the most pertinent uh, flight information here uh, in the airspeed indicator. You have an altimeter, gear status lights, as well as a low rotor enunciator and a rotor speed uh, RPM meter here. This way, uh, you can see more useful things when you're trying to hover. And uh, what I find is you still kind of want to keep your, your focus, the point at which you're looking, somewhere out in front of you. But at least now, more of your, the periphery of your vision will be filled with useful information that will tell you whether or not you're, you're kind of creeping forward to the side, right, left, or back. Now you just get a lot more information that makes holding a hover uh, something that can actually be achieved with some regularity. So to, to, to give you an example of this, uh, I know I've mentioned in the past that I'd kind of run through my technique of landing on the, the frigate or landing on an, on an oil rig. And so let's, let's finally go about doing that so you can kind of see in action what, what, what it is that I'm talking about and the value of this. So we'll select a special start. We'll, we'll make an approach to the oil platform. We'll hit confirm and we'll start the new flight, hopefully. Okay, so here we are. We're on uh, an approach here to the oil platform. And just for starters, for illustrative purposes, I'll show you the, the way that it has been and the, the challenges and misery that result from that. So here we are making our approach. And the, the, the difficulty you'll see will become exaggerated as we get closer and closer. You'll see to slow the aircraft, you really kind of need to pitch to a nose up attitude. And already we've lost sight of the helideck. Uh, so we've sort of resigned ourselves to guesswork now based on how close it seems that the derrick is and some of the smoke and the crane. Are we over the helideck? Who knows? I hope so. Uh, we can just kind of guess based on intuition and uh, kind of a, a wing and a prayer here, but there's really no telling if we're over the heli deck or not. Even if we switch to the forward no panel view, we're still so close or directly above the platform that we can't see and we can't we can't even look down. So this is really where the value of that this no panel view is. Um, now we can still see our altitude. We can still confirm that our landing gear is down, but hey, now we can actually see the platform. So if we want to land on it and actually not catastrophically roll off some piece of the rig and uh, have who knows what happens, now we can actually make an approach, hover, and land above the, the, the helideck and actually see and know that we're doing it properly. So let's kind of just translate forward here a little bit. I haven't done this in a while, so please forgive uh, the, the skill or lack thereof as we try to put it down here. But now I'm, I'm, I'm mostly keeping my, 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 the focus of my vision a little bit out towards the water, maybe on that, that radar, uh, weather radar, and the little man there that's standing on top of the, the stairs. And that's, uh, so we're not, we're not doing a vertical reference flying or anything like that. We're still kind of looking out and using the horizon as a reference, but now we can s actually see based on this little man and the weather radar here that we're, we're over the, over the platform or over the, the heli deck, I should say. 
and now we are actually on it. This way we can more consistently land and, well, we kind of missed the mark a little bit, but at least we're, we're on the helideck. And um, that's really the point. The point of this view is to, to see more, to be able to fill our field of vision with useful information that we really need to make a precise landing on a small target. And this, this, the heli deck on this oil platform, relative to how big this aircraft is, is a small target, probably smaller than you would ever actually try to land an S-92 in real life. But at least this way, you can do it with some regularity and some practice. Uh, we can look at a situation where we try to land on the frigate as another example. Without being able to see uh, the, sh the ship and the deck where you're trying to land, this would be nearly impossible. So let's take a look at that now. So here we go. And I think you get the idea rather than showing you how not to do it or how terrible it would be otherwise. Let's switch to this view. You can see based on the gear status lights that our wheels aren't down. So we'll put those down. They're transitioning now. Once they turn green, we know that they're down and locked. There we go. We'll continue this approach. Now, this is very similar to landing on the oil rig. The one difference here, which is kind of a big one, is that this landing zone is actually moving through the water. And depending on what you have the sea state and the weather settings set to, this uh, your landing zone could be bobbing up and down pretty dramatically. But in this case, uh, the, the sea state isn't too high. The ship's rocking a little bit, but the main difference is that your airspeed, unlike when you're landing on the rig, depending on what the winds are, is not going to come to zero. So you're not really technically hovering. You're only matching the speed of the ship. So you're hovering relative to the ship. Now, I just did a terrible job, unless we were doing an offset approach, which actually is maybe a, a decent idea especially if you're not too confident that you can stop on a dime where you have to. This way, if you had a missed approach, had to do a go around, you wouldn't slam into the, to the hangar bay here. You can kind of come to a relative hover and then kind of translate over to where you need to be. Now, the ship, just like the oil rig, is kind of small for a, a helicopter as big as the S-92. So when you're landing, if you're going to do it right and you're going to land on the center of the of the pads markings here, you're going to feel kind of disconcertingly close to this wall and the hangar bay here. Uh, so it takes a little bit of getting used to. Whoa. But there we go. That's right about where we need to be. And we're down. We did it. Thanks not so much to my skills or lack thereof of flying, but because we could actually see. And one thing that almost just happened to me that I should point out is that uh, the the pitch of the deck here that, that you're landing on is actually tilted forward. So my my thumb is on a button that I've assigned to the brake. And if those were off, we'd be rolling forward, as you can see. And we don't have much clearance left between the blades and the hangar bay. So what I suggest doing is once you've landed, uh, you'll probably want to make sure that the parking brake is turned on like that. That way you don't roll forward and uh, end up seeing the wreckage animation uh, that we created here. So that's that. Okay, something else that's changed, which is a small uh, adjustment, uh, but important nonetheless. Uh, it might be a little difficult to see here, but the the, the blurred rotor disc of the CH-148 and the VH-92 in the past hasn't been that smooth of a gradient, and that's always just kind of bothered me. So here, you can kind of see we've, we've fixed that. Before, there was a bit of a clump about midway down the, uh, the, sp the span of the blade, where a, a clump of pixels just always kind of stood out. 
here it's a much smoother transition from the, the root to the tip of the blade of, the, of that blurry texture. The CH-148 is, is a pretty cool example, too, of how this uh, PBR shading, the physically based rendering, works. You can see the metallic parts, like on the, on the torpedo there, really have an added shine and, and, and reflective property that really kind of help it stand out. And it's, it's easy to really see and recognize that that's, that's metallic, just based on how shiny and, and specular the the highlights and the sheen of it is. The same holds true for the, the infrared sensor here that's kind of hanging below the sponson. If that catches the sunlight, you'll see that the, the, the little panels there really light up. Let's see if we can move the position of the sun to show you what I'm talking about. There you go. As soon as the, the light hits it, it becomes very reflective and shiny the way that the, the glass panels really would be. And that little thing there on the bottom is, is what we're talking about, just behind the, the left main landing gear. One of the other big points of uh, shiny reflection is the exhaust, the main engine exhaust. You'll see that's actually reflecting the colors and some of the detail of the environment uh, and the metal there of the exhaust, which is pretty cool. Well, that's, that's about it um, as far as the things I wanted to touch on. For the update, uh, the main the main thing uh, that I really wanted to achieve was first and foremost to have this work and work reliably and properly within X Plane 11, which uh, now it does. And if it doesn't for you for some reason, by all means, let me know. Uh, if there's anything that can be improved upon, uh, I'm all ears. I'm always trying to keep this thing up to date, keep it fun, keep it interesting, and keep it useful to you. So hopefully this is a, a valuable addition, a, value, a valuable update for you, and uh, hopefully you have some, some fun and enjoyment uh, giving the new S92 and its variants uh, uh, a whirl in the simulator.